Okay. Well, I'd like to introduce myself. I'm Amy Schatz. I'm a reporter with the Wall Street Journal, and I cover uh, the FCC and tech policy. And I was uh, really uh, grateful to be uh, invited to come here today to moderate this panel. Um, yeah, I started covering the FCC about five years ago. And I was, I have to be honest, I was really excited about uh, covering that gig, even though um, some reporters in DC find this a little wonky. And uh, But I was really excited because I really like doing tech, and this is really the only tech gig you can get in DC for the Wall Street Journal. So I was pretty excited about this until um, I inherited a story from my predecessor about this really wonky issue called net neutrality. And uh, she sort of dumped it on my lap, went out the door, and said, no, thanks very much. Um, but what happened was that the Supreme Court had, as Austin just previously said, the Supreme Court had made a decision about cable modems, which basically were making people around town uneasy. And they were worried that cable and phone providers would start blocking internet traffic. They wanted net neutrality so internet providers wouldn't mess around with the traffic, basically. So, you know, writing a story, a front page story about net neutrality that's plain English enough to get past editors at the Wall Street Journal isn't really, I would have to say, it's probably one of the hardest things I've ever done. To this day, I'm, I'm really proud of that story, even though it's, it's probably not the, uh, the best prose I ever wrote. But just getting it in was, was amazing because, you know, techno speak gets pretty thick pretty quickly. And our panelists today have all promised that they're going to try to not walk out too much. But if we do, please say something or Twitter something, because I know there's a lot of folks out there who are on Twitter right now who are either watching us on the internet or they're actually on Twitter on the audience. And so please uh, feel free to speak up if we get too far into the weeds. Basically, the idea of net neutrality is that phone and cable companies should treat all legal internet traffic equally. They can't pick and choose which bits get to your laptop faster, and they can't prevent bits from getting there at all. There's, a lot of, there's some disagreement, probably maybe a lot of disagreement, on whether net neutrality is actually a good thing, because there are some companies out there who would like to, the option of offering premium internet content services that they could charge companies or consumers more for. So we have people on the panel today who are on both sides of this issue, and they're going to explain some of this for everyone, hopefully, and as, as walk-free as possible. So we're also really interested in what you're thinking and your questions. So please, if you're on Twitter, please tweet a question. Uh, we will we'll be compiling them and, and hopefully be asking them later. Um, but, and you name it, great things. Ener you know, it's, it's pushing things on, things like smart grid and energy independence and things like that. Do we like that, healthcare, or do we want to place control of the internet in the hands of telephone and cable companies. Jamie? Um, so th this morning there was a thing of doing caveats, and I thought it was a pretty nice trend. So I'd like to jump in here, start out with a caveat, which is that I wasn't able to make contact with all the other artists in the world, and so I'm going to be speaking just for myself. I'm not a representative. <laughs> um, because I know there's a lot of people who are very well informed, and I am not. So I think I'll be representing sort of the, the uninformed layman on this issue. And, I, and as someone who's on tour right now, I think, you know, what strikes me is that what I'm always looking for is the internet. I go to a cafe, is there internet here? And I think for, in, for us, internet is like air, and you kind of want the air just to be clean everywhere, and you don't ask too many questions about it. And so I think my natural tendency would be you know, to, to favor net neutrality, because you want, you want the air just to be right. You want it to function correctly, and, and you don't want this air to be cleaner over here and dirtier over there. And so I'll start from that um, very simplistic place and see where this panel takes me. Okay. <clears throat> Thanks, Amy. Uh, so I represent internet and technology companies uh, I have for uh, 16 years or so, uh, and including internet companies that were at the very beginning of the commercial internet. And uh, I guess the point I would make is that um, the rhetoric in Washington tends to be about uh, gets, gets exaggerated into regulating the internet or not regulating the internet, and are we going to have government in, uh, control over the internet and not, and the rhetoric really, rhetoric really doesn't match in any way uh, the substance of the proceedings. Uh, so there have been rules that have applied that have protected the internet since the very founding of the commercial internet. I think we're at a very fascinating moment in communications policy because in the mid-90s when I was representing internet companies, Congress passed a couple of laws that enable the internet to work today, that enable Web 2.0 to work. So two of those laws were uh, the DMCA that, that governs uh, the transmission of copyrighted material. And the second one was Section 230 of the Communications Decency Act, which does which makes sure that internet companies are not held liable for the postings of third parties. 
without that law, you would not have Web 2.0. You would not have blogs. You would not have uh, comments. Uh, you would not have Twitter. Uh, because they would all be liable for things, uh, defamatory statements or other statements that are made. Those two laws, I would I would suggest to you, today, those laws were passed when the internet was in its infancy, and the stakeholders that sort of rally against internet freedom today would probably oppose those laws, and they would argue, well, that's you know, no liability for internet companies will uh, encourage uh, illegal behavior. We can't give unfettered uh, uh, ability for consumers and non-discrimination, non-discriminatory statements, uh, traffic to be to be transmitted. There needs to be more control to protect uh, the ecosystem and other stakeholders. I'm, I have no doubt that those two laws would not be able to be passed in their current form today because of the political might that uh, would be generated by uh, well-entrenched Washington players. So the fact that we're now arguing again, I think we're at another moment that, that mirrors those mid-90s in, in that it's an essential point here to say, is the Internet going to continue to function as this great tool of innovation and democracy, democratization that Gigi mentioned, or is it going to start turning into something that's that's a lot different? And that's what network neutrality is about when I say a lot different, meaning that that you're going to have the gatekeepers, the ISPs, uh, have a greater control over what you can access on the Internet uh, and what you can, what sites you can go see. The, I think we have, we have two very smart people here, Rick and Chris, and the arguments that they're going to make and have made that there ought to be uh, accountabilities for quality of service, or there has to be there has to be accountability for network management because of network constraints and the way things are engineered. All can happen. Those things can happen in a neutral, non-discriminatory, non-discrimination world. Uh, and the internet will continue to be the engine of growth and commerce that it's been, and still protect the wireless industry's ability to protect their networks, and still make sure that illegal content uh, can be handled, and that content that you want to have some quality of service around. Uh, can have that kind of quality of service. It just won't be done in a discriminatory fashion, in a way that is unfair uh, to small actors. So that's what this debate's really about. Uh, thank you, Amy. Um, <clears throat> I, I heard Markham suggest that the rhetoric in Washington, D.C. Is, is loud and perhaps over the top. And then he suggested that there's a group in this debate that rallies against Internet freedom, which I think is pretty much at the top of rhetoric spouting, right? I don't think there's anyone on any side of this debate that would rally against Internet freedom. It, it, it just really is not that simple. Um, I also heard Gigi talk about uh, using words, and I went back and looked at some of uh, public knowledge's filings, and they talk about words like preserving and maintaining. And I just heard Mark, uh, Markham say that, uh, are we going to continue to allow the, inter the Internet to function as it does now? To me, that's the core of what this debate is about. The Internet is functioning. It is working. There is an explosion that is happening, has happened, and will continue to happen. When you look at this in the wireless space, which is the, the constituency that I represent, and you think that something that many would argue was a pretty simple debate, what did Comcast do and was it reasonable? Took two years, two months, and five days. Do we really want that process measuring what is right or not right in a space that moves as quickly as the internet or perhaps even faster in a space that moves as quickly as the wireless space? So you go back 20 months from where we are now and the hottest selling handset in the United States was the Motorola Razor. In the last 20 months, we've gone through about 50 of the world's cutting-edge devices, all launched first here in the United States. We've gone from 24 applications to 270,000 applications, including, if you just look at my device, the Palm Pre, 5% uh, of all of the applications on this are music-related applications, none of which existed six months ago. So to us, we look at this, it is not that simple. Uh, Johnny, Jamie suggested that he just wants it to work. That's what's at the core of this, just wanting it to work and handing over that process of what is reasonable or unreasonable, whether Austin or the chairman suggest that it's a light touch or not, takes two and a half years to get through what many, again, would argue was a pretty simplistic case of defining reasonable versus unreasonable. So for us, 
it, it, it isn't cut and dry, and it isn't about rallying against Internet freedom. It's about handing over the, the, the control, handing over the management, handing over the yes or no to the FCC. And if you think it's just about the carriers, look at all the, look at all the infrastructure manufacturer comments, and I'm sure I'll get a chance to, to state some of them. But all of the infrastructure, all the folks that make everything that drives the Internet, that makes it that ecosystem. Look what they've said about the concerns about handing this over to the FCC. So I wanted to go back to something that Markham had um, talked about a little bit, which is like this quality of service thing. And I'm not sure everybody understands um, what that means, really, because it. And, and I'm sure you guys can talk a little about this more technically. But it was always my understanding that the internet, every all the traffic on the internet was basically from when it was really started, everything was sort of delivered on a best efforts basis and you try to get stuff there. And so you try, when you send an email, your provider tries to get it there, but they don't offer you any sort of guarantee when it's going to show up. They just have to offer the best effort to get there. What, I think what some of the providers are really talking about doing here and one of the reasons why net neutrality has gotten involved in this is that they're really talking about guaranteed delivery now. So it's sort of, that's why everybody comes up with sort of this mail service analogy, which is, you know, you pop your letter in the mailbox and Lord only knows when it gets there, but it'll get there eventually. Whereas if you send it to FedEx or UPS, it's probably going to get there overnight. And if not, they got to refund you your money. Um, so I wondered if, if, and if this kind of gets into the idea that if everybody agrees on the panel that internet freedom is a good thing and, and no one wants to change the internet, um, then what should the rules be here then? Is there some agreement that everybody can reach? Because I think a lot of folks, a lot of consumers would sort of side with Jamie on this and just that, you know, they don't understand really what's going on, but they just want it to not change because they like, except for the fact it may be a little expensive, they kind of like the way it is right now. Well, I, I think it's really important that we, again, getting back to Markham's point and also addressing Chris's point, what we're really talking about here, okay? We're not talking about the FCC police going around trying to find infractions by internet service providers, by the telephone and cable companies. What we're talking about is a process by which if consumers believe that their internet service provider is somehow favoring some content over other content or blocking applications that they're going to have a place to go. Okay, so I don't foresee a flood of, uh, of complaints. But right now, and particularly in light of the Comcast case, consumers, internet users, have absolutely no place to go if another Comcast situation comes up. So that's really all we're talking about. And I think that's really, really important. And when you say it's not guaranteed delivery, okay, it's prioritized delivery. It's them who can pay, get faster, faster service, and better quality of service. And that is antithetical to the end-to-end -end nature of the internet. And Chris talks about, yeah, everything's great. Trust us. All right. So number one, is, I want to ask you, who do you trust? Who should you trust? And number two is every single CEO of major internet service providers has said, we want to do this prioritization. They're not doing it now because of the uncertainty, but they want to do it. They want Google they, to pay. They want Yahoo to pay. They want eBay to pay. They want whoever is willing to pay for this faster service or, or better quality of service to pay. So, so let's, the, the reason the internet is, we want to preserve the internet is because the, the, the ISPs haven't quite yet had the guts to go ahead and move forward with their business plans. Well, that's not entirely correct, and, and, and so I'll, I'll take that leap and perhaps shoot myself in the foot. <laughs> but we prioritize every day, right, on the wireless side. Your voice calls are, are again, our, our conduit, our pipes, our spectrum, we share uh, services and, and, um, and uh, capabilities across our, our pipeline. So uh, our, your voice calls are prioritized over your data sessions, your interactive data over your standard data, your VOIP calls are prioritized uh, over a, a different types of packets. Um, in fact, strangely, the FCC specifically said in its original item that wireless carriers and others cannot degrade VOIP that's, that's one example of, uh, of unacceptable behavior. In order for us to not degrade VOIP, we have to prioritize it. So we prioritize it perhaps to the detriment of other packages, but if not, and I actually said this on a panel sitting right here about a month ago, if not, you're uh, I, call, would sound something like this. 
Okay, so so we literally do that. We prioritize all the time. I've gotten pretty good at that. I've been practicing with my daughters. <laughs> you get? Do people um, pay you? Does, are the companies paying you to prioritize? Well, no, but the but the reality. But uh, well, that's really important, Chris. No, but you suggested that there isn't prioritization happening. There there is network management. There's not prioritization thinks, for pay. Okay, but let me everyone thinks what this notion of network management is to the benefit of some behemoth, you know, company that that is uh, out there to make billions of dollars. Net networks are managed so that consumers have a reasonable experience, so that they get a sense of what they're going to get and it's delivered to them. So in the wireless space, uh, to the extent that three, four, or five of you in this room decide that you want to download a, a high-definition video, you are simultaneously impacting everyone else in this area on that network. Now, that's okay, but the reality is if you want to have an experience, if you want Johnny's experience where it just works, People have to be able to manage it and manage it in real time. And, and, that's, and there is prioritization that is happening. And there are, people do look at packets. We look at packets every day to prevent spyware and malware and spam. So this notion that deep, paddock in, deep packet inspection is some evil, evil thing is just misplaced. So, Chris, you're okay, not so looking no, inside we're the packets. This down. I mean, no, come no. on, tell the truth. Come yeah, on, you're not looking just, inside look, the packets. You're looking at the headers. Mark, if you get one point. second, and then we're going to move on. This is an incredibly complex issue, quality of service. But I think that what you're hearing is um, that certainly networks should and, and are being managed, and that's a good thing. Um, what we don't want to see quality of service turn into is uh, prioritization that incentivizes continued uh, uh, decreases of investment into infrastructure. There have been, since the Internet was developed, uh, calls that the networks would fail <coughs> because of increased traffic. That's never happened. We've, the, the most economically efficient way to deal with congestion is increased infrastructure. That's empirically been proven. So we don't want to create that, and we, we want to be able to have Chris, what Chris is doing, his member companies do, are doing to prevent spyware and, and spam and to ensure that VoIP, uh, your calls have priority, can happen. But he makes a good point, and this is a fundamental uh, concept. When you prioritize or favor one piece of traffic over another, and there are legitimate reasons for doing that, as Chris mentioned, it does mean that you are putting, you're degrading other traffic. It, everything on the internet travels at light speed. You, there's no, you can't make something faster than light speed. So what you do to prioritize one packet is actually to put a different packet, someone else's content, at the back of the line. Now that may make sense, but as soon as you start doing it based on the economic ability of those providers that are trying to just send that content, their willingness to pay to be prioritized, not because voice consumers want their voice calls to work better than their data packets, right? That's, that's a no-brainer. But if you start saying to Microsoft, but because you have the most money, we'll make sure you get prioritized, and the person in their garage's packets will go to the back of the line, there's no policy reason to do that except for creating new markets and new business opportunities for the network operators. That's what we oppose. So I'd like to so bring you back down to the, the, what I was originally asking about. So from the music side of this, you know, you know, I'd like Jamie and, and Rick yeah. sort of like talk about, you know, if you're looking for rules as users of the internet and as people who actually rely on the internet to get your songs out and, and your, your, your videos out to, to your fans, what would you really like to see the rules to be and, and what are you the most interested in? Um, as, as a professional creator of content, uh, the reason why I'm in favor of not discrimination but prioritization of a content delivery network is because what I want to do, you know, for years they've been telling us you have to give a better product if you're going to compete with free, okay? And the government has shown no desire to step in and do anything about piracy to speak of. So what I'm hoping is that we can give them a better quality of service through content delivery networks. Now, I foresee content delivery networks as being paid for partially by the content delivers, not really the ISPs. I would think a universal music or something would say, okay, look, we want to deliver our videos on this channel, and they pay to get a faster set of service. And I don't see that as discriminating against 
the consumers. I don't see that discriminating. I mean, I, that's where I'm seeing content you know, delivery I, networks. I don't think GG or I have any problem with that. Content delivery networks are not, are, they're open to anybody. Uh, people, number of big and small companies use, use those. They're third party services like Akamai that are content delivery networks. Right. A lot of gaming things. The, the, yeah, yeah, they're in a fundamentally different position than your last mile ISP that controls your access to those content delivery networks and to the uh, and to the, the internet itself. So if Universal Music wants to put their music catalog in a content delivery network, we have no problem with that. Yeah. So Jamie, what do you think about this? I mean, what kind of rules would you want to see or what kind of protections would you want to have as someone who not just uses it but actually relies on it to get to, get to your fans? Right. I mean, honestly, I think a lot of this is a trade-off. I mean, I think there's for me, the, the backlash you get from fans at any point where there's any sense that, that, that they are being messed with in any way um, far outweighs any sense of you know, being able to market this prioritization. And in fact, usually I've found that when, especially if it's done by major labels, when there's an attempt to sort of um, do something that they see as smart, like moving everything from YouTube to Vivo, it usually has kind of obvious foreseeable negative repercussions, like the fact that our video went from like a... 30 million play count to a you know 1 million play count because the play count just erased. So I really don't I don't see any reason to do anything other than just go for full you know full net neutrality just because I think that is I think I I am most affected by the conventional wisdom of fans who may not always be the most informed people but the second they see anything that's like you know we use your we had a christmas video and we use handlebars and then we got a cease and desist order see if I come to a flowbots concert. That's the way people see it. They they see that as something that we've done. So my, my interest is in making people feel like their that their air is not polluted and that their so, internet I, is working the way so, it's supposed to. You know, so as bands and you know, I list, I used to live in Austin. I used to have a lot of friends who were in bands and they were always trying to like make more money because they didn't want to have to cut grass anymore or work in bars or whatever, and they just wanted to go be able to tour and stuff. I mean, is there is there something to this idea that Rick is talking about that you know you could have potentially this idea of of having a priority service, some kind of service where you could offer like a really high quality concert experience to your fans who could like be able to hook this up to their TV or something so they could see you and maybe for like 10 or 15 bucks or whatever. I mean, do you think there's anything to that or do you think that's sure, something I mean, that... This is kind of where it's important that I'm really not a spokesperson because I feel like I've, we, in some ways we kind of bypass this little zone of, I think there's a lot of artists out there that may be in a situation where they're looking very much at that. That's not something that we're looking at a whole lot right now, but okay. I'd rather have someone else. Uh, again, this is really... A, it gets to, down to a very, very simple calculation, is whether the ISP is going to control your experience or you're going to control your experience, okay? So if, if Rick's Content Delivery Network wants to use Akamai, just like a million other content application service providers, uh, to get his content faster, that's fine. But if it's going to be the bottleneck internet service provider making that determination, Okay, with all the high switching costs and lack of competition, and, you know, and, and, and the you know, unique relationship that the ISP has with the subscriber, okay, that's a different story. Okay, we don't have any problem with you know, edge providers that provide a better experience. There's lots of them. I also don't have a problem with a consumer prioritizing their traffic so long as it doesn't affect other traffic. Right, so right now you can configure your wireless router at home to, to send certain content uh, faster than others. No problem with that. Also don't have a problem with consumers paying more for more bandwidth. Okay, there are those that say, well, net neutrality would prohibit that. That's ridiculous. All right, I'm happy to pay for my Mach 10 service from RCN, even though it keeps getting worse every year, uh, while others pay for Mach 5. So, you know, there are lots of ways to skin the cat here, but the one way we don't want to skin the cat is by giving the bottleneck gatekeeper, the telephone company and the cable company who provides your on-ramp to the Internet, giving them the power to control your experience. But, so, but in, in, in a perfect world, well, first of all, in a perfect world, my 10-year-old wouldn't like boys yet <laughs> and wouldn't constantly pressure me to buy her a cell phone. Um, but in a, in a perfect world... Uh, that may be possible, but the notion that when you've got, you know, 20, 30, 60, 90 million customers on a wireless network, the notion that a consumer is going to decide how, who, when, where, and what to prioritize is just staggeringly impossible, right? I mean, the, the notion that, you know, as soon as the five of us moved onto this panel, the dynamics of, of the spectrum network at this table changed at this spot 
last week I took my device and I took five readings for, for the speed of, uh, of service that I was getting without moving every two minutes. So for a 10 minute period, I took five readings. Every two minutes, the, the speed that I received changed at least 20% without exception from a high of 2.6 to a low of 1.2 without me moving a millimeter just sitting in my office space on 16th and P a couple blocks from here. That, that shows you, any of you step outside and look how many bars you have on your device and then watch it for a minute and see if it doesn't go from two to three to four or from five to four to three. The network and the handset are talking to one another and they're constantly adjusting which cell sites you're, you're, uh, you're, you're utilizing. Every one of us that utilize our device then impact the capacity within that cell site. We're not suggesting that anyone should be able to uh, prioritize to one large uh, you know, website over a small website. I've, I've seen advertisements with a woman who sells mushrooms from, uh, from a place in Pennsylvania, and she's afraid that without net neutrality, her mushroom business would, uh, would disappear. I don't think she's at risk. Okay? The reality here is Markham talked about suggesting that there may be an incentive or a rationale to invest less in your networks. And then his rationale is, is to, I don't know, provide some form of regulation of it. I, I don't understand how that even makes sense in anyone's world. So, so for us, the idea is we want to provide that experience so that your consumers have a great time. We want to move from second generation to third to fourth generation technology. We want to get to 100 megabits per second and all of this unbelievable increase in technology and innovation happened because the networks went from analog to digital. And then they went from digital to third generation. As soon as they went to third generation, the handsets changed and the app space exploded. So I wanted to raise, I think you raised like kind of an interesting question. Actually, this was sort of going to the next question I want to talk about because it is sort of the issue of transparency. Um, because I think this is one of the really interesting parts of net neutrality because, you know, if your car, if you start hearing like a, you like your, you start hearing your you know, your brakes are squealing or something, you know something is wrong with your car and you need to take it in. But if, if your internet connection is slow or you can't like actually make your connection to Amazon to buy your book or whatever, you're not sure if it's your computer, you're not sure if it's your network, you're not sure if it's Amazon's network or, or what the problem is because it's just almost impossible to figure out how these things work, right, for normal human beings. And so I just wonder if this kind of gets to this issue. With net neutrality, you're never quite sure what happened. And are there any, is there anything that the government or anybody could do to try to increase the transparency for consumers so they have a better idea? I think the RCN thing that um, Oscar Schlick was talking about earlier where RCN had, there was some class action lawsuit where they were complaining that RCN was doing the same thing that Comcast was doing. And that was going on underneath Gigi's nose and she's, a, she's an RCN <laughs> subscriber. And she had no, I, I don't know if you had an idea. I never heard you talk about it. Um, nobody has any idea.